It's more myth, but bigger. To get the hard stuff out of the way, this game is much easier to set up than the Fallen Lords. You just install Myth 2, and then Project Magma over that. There are no options to check, no levels to download, do the tutorial and you're good to go. What are you doing? How do you expect to learn anything? This is handy since one was a trial to set up, including one absolutely bizarre issue. You may have noticed on some, but not all missions, the Berserkers are bigger than they should be, and it only happened while the TFL gameplay option was enabled. Did I have a weird plugin? Was there some kind of engine scaling issue? No, it turns out that someone out there really, really likes the Zerkers. And there are now clients floating around that make them bigger if TFL is enabled. Some fan groups even had this version as their default for years unnoticed. They are supposed to be big boys, but the ride never ends trying to play this thing. You can get it to run and find out a few missions in, you have the Gachi Muchi fan edition. Anyhow, you've already gotten the recap of the Fallen Lords. Balor was defeated and his head tossed into the Great Devoid. Or golfed into it. The manual prologue isn't too necessary this time around, since the game itself will tell you what you need to know. A ten-year-old child is talking about the end of the Great War 60 years ago. Balor may have been killed, but no one is sure what happened to Soul Blighter. By most accounts, he escaped in a murder of crows and hasn't been seen since. Until the child starts seeing crows, and then Soul Blighter himself, who plucks out his eyeballs. The intro also shows Ulrich, who is now king, having nightmares about the war before also encountering a crow. From the title, you probably guessed he would be back. But it's more a question of how and why. After all, the Fallen Lords were defeated, and Balor, the source of their power, was completely destroyed. Is this old-fashioned revenge, or is there something greater at play? Ulrich did go from being wizard to decapitated to king, so your mastery of dream magic in this setting gives you lots of career and retirement options. Once again, the story is told from the journal of a soldier in the Legion. He's under the command of a political climber named Kruniak. In his latest endeavor, he's wasting a soldier's time making them investigate some grave robbing. The town is under attack! Run for your lives! Oh, so Undead attacked the town, and the soldier's time is about to get a lot more interesting. Things are going to be a little different this time around, so let's start with the graphics. Coming off the back of the Fallen levels, which were remade in the Soul Blighter engine, you might think that 2 would be looking largely the same, but those remakes were very faithful and they didn't add a lot of stuff that 2 had. The tutorial and the first screen in Myth 2's campaign are already showing off the improvements. You have a moving 3D object with world reflections in the river, lots of small foliage, the map has livestock and wildlife, more 3D objects, and just more detail in general. Granted, they're not the kind of improvements that are super obvious to modern eyeballs, but by just playing the game you can feel how much more intricate the maps are. Myth did have the Tane, but never an actual gigantic building as a mission. It's one of those sequels that the 90s and 2000s were full of that you don't see too often today. The budgets and teams are smaller, production hasn't ballooned to an insane degree, they're no longer struggling with what the first game is going to be, so now the sequel has a lot of mechanical improvements. For Myth's visuals, this meant a better detailed world and a better variety of environments. All the story elements have also gotten a big facelift. For example, in the briefings, instead of just a map of what's happening, the game now cycles through multiple pieces of artwork. This might not sound like a big deal, but it's timed with the already incredible music and narration. It brings the scenes even more to life having these visuals. They're an actual extra little window into the setting. Speaking of scenes, the videos that Myth 1 had were technically impressive, though currently you are stuck with the interlaced in-game ones, if those even play, or the washed out over-brightened remaster attempt for QuickTime. The original materials could be on a computer somewhere, but so far they haven't been found. That's not the case for the second game, and the cutscenes look awesome. Not just viewing quality-wise, but the art style is a huge improvement. I mean, just compare how Soul Blighter looks across the versions. Considering the material, even some developers weren't satisfied with how the Myth 1 cutscenes turned out. So for 2, the animation was outsourced to a Japanese company, Anime International. Instead of Disney, it now reminds me more of 97 Berserk. And if you're tickling that part of my brain, you're automatically getting points. Though I think the only thing I've seen from the company is Blue Gender, which I never thought I'd bring that up in one of these videos. If you like mechs murdering nightmare bugs, you might like it. It's been a long time, but wow, I never imagined a myth connection. Still, there have been good visual improvements all around. It's not a complete overhaul, and it didn't need to be. The team already did a great job with appealing character designs and smart use of color. They didn't try to fix what wasn't broken, and instead added on to it. The landscape is richer, the animation is smoother, and it can be harder to notice or appreciate nowadays, especially if you are using the Fallen levels for Myth 1. The sound design is in a similar spot. Ambient sounds are improved and have more variety, but there still won't be any music in the missions themselves. 
The voice acting is also about the same quality, both in highs and lows. Though to their credit, there is noticeably more in-game, which does make the setting feel that little bit more alive. Well, you must be saving up for a reason, huh? Yep, yep. I've had my eye on a turnip for quite a while now. A turnip? Well, not just any turnip, the world's biggest turnip. This conversation's like something straight out of Thief. Once again, the briefings are the highlight. They're as captivating as ever. When we reached Tallow, Rorik told the mayor he had overheard the brigands speaking of taking corpses to a castle near the town of Braille. Indeed, the locals we encountered on the way said they had seen many wagons filled with bodies being hauled into the keep. The master of this castle is Baron Kildare. We were joined at Tallow by reinforcements to attack the Baron's stronghold and put an end to his unwholesome trade in human remains. As we hurried back to Willow Creek, Rurik, one of the village leaders, demanded to be taken to see the mayor of Tallow. When questioned, he offered as little, save that he had important information about the recent grave robberies. Rurik is well respected by the townspeople, so Kruniak chose not to press him further for information. It's the same narrator playing a new character, but come on, who's gonna complain? The somber emotional tracks are still here, but the music can get more bold this time around too. The percussion is definitely the most ramped up and big echoey drums can take center stage. It can be fast, aggressive military marching beats, and then it shifts. It turns slow and haunting and sounds like Phil Collins is about to start singing. One of these briefings has my favorite moment in the series and the music just brings it to a new level. I'll have to hold off on that since I don't want to get too far ahead. And there have been some gameplay changes to go over. Starting off, it does have a lot you'd expect in a sequel like this, such as new units. The Light can use black-robed warlocks and mortar-wielding dwarves, along with some other additions and changes to existing units. For example, the Archers and the Fallen Lords were the Fearbolg. For most of the setting's history, they were an enemy of human nations. At least they were until Balor came and Kinetic smashed the moral relativity scale. They've since returned home and all of your Archers in the sequel are human, but they can now use a Flaming Arrow ability to set the terrain on fire. Meanwhile, the forces of evil have recruited a few more races onto their side. Some bizarre new undead have been seen as well, such as the Stygian Knights. They're completely immune to arrows as well. It's like the shades weren't enough ancient Greek terror. The units come with updated lore bits as well, and the secret mission in the first game definitely happened. Still, while everything does look generally similar, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay does feel different for a few reasons. The first is AI, which seemed pretty good throughout most of the Fallen Lords. Though, on some magical points of a map, enemies wouldn't respond or they would start looping. It's worth noting that these games have a lot of maps and modes for multiplayer, but no actual skirmish mode versus the AI. That's because the real replayability would be in multiplayer. Myth AI isn't how you think of it in most RTS games. Instead, the units are tailor-scripted for the mission and where they are in the level. If you experiment, you can find areas where the enemy will run back to their designated point. You can cheese it at points, but it's what makes the campaign play so much more reactively compared to a lot of its peers. The designers knew exactly what units you in the dark would have and where you would be on the map. The AI can't fully take the wheel on its own, but for a campaign, it's great. And two added more variables and reactions into that mix. Chickens, attack! <laughs> However, the most immediately noticeable change starting the game is accuracy. In the first mission, a dwarf feels kind of reliable. It still relies on the physics, and especially elevation, and making your troops veterans is still always helpful, but it feels infinitely less frustrating this time around. The dwarf explosions feel better controlled, and you can take some risks at close range. Now, you can absolutely still vaporize your own guys by accident. A chance of a whiff is still in play, and sometimes making an attack is just a bad call. But you don't have the frustration of constantly exploding yourself like the first game, even if you put yourself in a good position. Not feeling as compelled to save scum is good, and it gave me options I would have never tried to pull off in the Fallen Lords. That's not to say the game is easy, because some of these missions are still hard as hell. One has you return to Covenant to retrieve the Total Codex from the rebuilt Great Library. This one can be a doozy on normal, but man. The Library on Legendary is a sadistic mission. The game hasn't been dumbed down, there are still plenty of spankings that await you. Though the campaign comes across as an overall more fair challenge. The difficulty settings still scale everything the same way, except for one mission. On normal, you'll find a bald hilltop for your troops to fight from, but on legendary, it's covered in trees and not really viable. The environment changing from difficulty again reminds me of Thief, and with how the AI works, who knows how long this took to alter. The difference between normal and legendary in this series can already make the missions feel like a different game, but even if there aren't any other subtleties like this in the game, this example is still very unique to the genre. Usually you would expect more and deadlier enemy units, which this game does too, 
or just have the AI cheat beyond all belief. So it's cool to see some experimenting on top of what was already a lot of innovation. The workload for that kind of feature does mean it not catching on made sense, but the ambition on display, even with a little thing like that, keeps surprising and impressing me. Anyhow, formations are snappier, how groups of units engage feels a little different, but these are the highlights to see in the campaign. I should get on that, but was there anything I forgot? Oh yeah! Fun fact about this game that some people confuse with the Fallen Lords. When Myth 2 was on the way to stores, a third-party translator found a major bug in the installer. If the game was installed somewhere other than the default path and then uninstalled, it could delete folders and files around it. This was discovered when Soulblighter wiped out the entire drive. Rather than just putting out a warning in a patch online, they flat out recalled the game. It was expensive, a logistics nightmare, and during December. Realistically, they could have gotten away with the announcement option, but the man behind the decision said it was expensive, but the right thing to do. It's a level of integrity that you just cannot imagine from the AAA space nowadays. If someone now asked their boss to delay a game due to a major but niche issue with the uninstaller, they'd probably try to fax that employee a low-tier god gift since they're not quite sure how their own cell phone works. There's a good chunk of people who thought that story was about the first game, but no, it's Soulblighter. Speaking of, I'm getting into the campaign now, so spoilers from here on out. See, a town being attacked by the undead is alarming, but not catastrophic. There were other necromancers in the setting's history, like the Watcher. Balor was just on another level with the practice. Kruniak's investigating also reveals that some local bandits have been taking villagers away to a nearby graveyard. It could all be the work of a minor second session D&D boss. The area can be ominous, but there's no sign of any warlord. Only some prisoners. But even after clearing the graveyard, the attacks are still coming. So one of the villagers leads you to the nearby town of Tallow to consult their mayor. If the villager doesn't make it, you'll be even more reminded of the 90s. Rorg has been killed. You bastards! Also odd is that if you go out of your way to kill some frogs, you'll unlock a secret mission. But unlike the one in the Fallen Lords, this one is a straight up joke. It's a deer hunting mission with actually sound hunting advice. It doesn't help too much in game since the blunderbusses have some kind of anti-tank caliber and the deer are incredibly aggressive. They're everywhere! It is a tricky one, but we need to move on. Casualties. After consulting the mayor, it's revealed that many corpses being robbed were being taken to a nearby castle ruled by a baron. Our soldier narrator is relieved, since attacking the keep directly means likely avoiding most of the undead. It is ironic that Kruniak is meeting politicians and shaking hands, but in a very different way than what he imagined. This mission in particular shows off a lot of the Myth 2 improvements. There are functional gates, and a moving 3D drawbridge that you'll need to cross in order to enter the keep. Which is done using a dwarf infiltrator who arrives, all during the same mission. You're using the enhanced terrain features, you're encountering the new units. It may look similar, but the gameplay improvements are really noticeable. Though compared to the Fallen Lords at this point, the story isn't drawing me in as much. Which could be a consequence of calling the game Soul Blighter and having him in the manual. Investigating where the undead are coming from isn't too compelling when you know that Soul Blighter is somehow behind it. The keep is stormed, and the soldier is gaining new respect for Kruniak. Until he begins to strangle one of the prisoners to the brink of death. But this turns out to not be from rage, it shakes the prisoner out of some kind of enchantment. It's possible the Baron is bewitched too, but we don't have time to reason with him, we'll have to use sword logic. The prisoner reveals his escape routes, and now they're no good. The keep is won, right as messengers arrive to say that every town outside of it has been completely destroyed. Every village you've helped so far has been wiped off the earth by an ocean of undead. All that Kruniak can do is order the keep destroyed to avoid capture, and then sound a general retreat. It's clear the Baron was only one of many suppliers of undead, and he might not have been doing it willingly. With those numbers, it's obvious the Dark are back. Kruniak is dead. Our Sergeant Garrick says he saw the commander and half of the color guard running like hell back through the lines, ordering a general retreat. When Garrick caught up with him, Kruniak collapsed. He had been holding his guts in with his shield. Kruniak's last words were of the bravery of the color guard who had given their lives trying to save him, even as Soul Blighter had delivered the killing blow. Soul Blighter. It is in that System Shock 2 wheelhouse where I wish the aspects around the game weren't undercutting some of its reveals. It doesn't stop the death of Kruniak from being sad and also very human. The narrator had him written off as just being a career guy, but in a time of crisis he rose to the challenge and continued until he died heroically. His last words were passing on how brave the other men had been. He wasn't a chosen one or someone who rose up to become a powerful legendary figure, he was just some guy. It's a kind of understated heroism that's more true to real life. Heroes are generally made in moments and not born as them. It's a kind of grounding that fantasy stories especially can have trouble keeping. 
Kruniak is dead by Soulblighter's hands, but he had a familiar journal among his belongings, which the narrator reads up on. With King Ulrich being the only surviving member of the Nine, he's all you can run off to in the city of Madrigal. Ulrich believes that Soulblighter's seeking out the Summoner, which the old narrator briefly learned about in the first game. He's the one that the Total Codex prophesized would bring back the Myrcridia. The Myrcridia? Oh, fuck. I mean, Balor was lively Sauron, and even he hated thinking about them. Soulblighter wouldn't dream of trying this if he was still alive. What is the plan here? Is he stupid? Well, the Seventh Legion is sent to the library to check out the Total Codex and slow down Soulblighter's progress. With all the joy that comes with that. Weeks pass and Soulblighter has ravaged hundreds of miles, destroying several major cities. Ulrich and the Legion receive a message from a survivor whose eyes were gouged out by a withering, grotesque woman. She said to him, Tell Ulrich his nightmare has just begun. Disturbed, he sends the Legion north to recruit while he hangs back in Magical to make sure everyone evacuates safely. This plan gets one hell of a complication. Casualties. Casualty. A swarm of creatures is attacking the capital, and they are absolute monsters in melee. Even if you're trying to play carefully and with Ulrich's dream magic, their sheer brutality will rip your forces apart if you make a mistake. Plus, you know how myth is. It's a vicious fight, and Ulrich and the survivors barely escape into the harbor. Then out comes the woman. It's Shiver. Didn't she die in that... duel? Well, the exact wording was, she fell. But regardless, death only seems to be a temporary setback for users of advanced dream magic. When the dead speak, you should listen. Except that Ulrich thinks whatever trick the Head told the Nine before to defeat her won't work again. The Head hasn't been seen since the end of the Great War anyways, and who knows what he's up to. Our deepest fears have been realized. Soulblighter has found the Summoner, and through him has unleashed the Myrcridia on the world. The Myrcridia are officially back. Wait, these are the Myrcridia? They're ferocious, but they're just big bat people. Even the Trow seemed more terrifying. Off-screen ancient evils get tricky when you show them. It's not the first game to do this, and definitely won't be the last. And as an evil fantasy creature, they aren't a bad design and do look deadly. The issue is they're mythologized to where only a demigod could take them down. And while Ulrich is clearly the best at it, your other soldiers can survive them. Their strength was as a storytelling device that added flavor to the world and a lot of mystery and depth to its main villain. The writing was so good at powering your imagination of them that, let's be honest, no unit in a 1998 RTS game would do them justice. Playing the game, the reveal, and how tough they are does feel appropriate, but my brain can't fully accept they're the beings that made this, even when they show it to me in-game. I think invoking them to make Soulblighter a bigger threat was the right choice, but they were already doing that. They're also introduced so suddenly you might just think they're another new evil race, and not the mere Critia. Hell, the reason one of them is the first thing you see in the Fallen Lords video is because I figured no one would think this is the ancient evil. They're cool on their own, I get why they did this, but I hope you see where I'm coming from. Besides, after a massive invasion at the rendezvous point, things start getting interesting. Capturing this location will keep Shiver held back, but the rest of the forces are out in a quest. Soulblighter is alive, Shiver is still alive or resurrected, so killing Balor didn't destroy the Fallen, only their armies. Others could still be alive, like the Deceiver, who you saw turn on allied forces in the Great War. Ulrich wants to find the Deceiver. Maybe he'll hate Shiver and Soulblighter more than us and we can recruit him. Recruit the Deceiver. He makes the snake from Stronghold seem subtle. Trust me. Wasn't the Deceiver killed at the end of the Great War? Aye, but he's a fallen lord after all. Through the magic of the dreams. It takes a while to properly get on the trail, but one of the journeymen in the Legion was there at the fight where he was defeated. He's frozen in stasis beneath a river with only enough power to keep himself alive. He did have a powerful scepter artifact, so by finding it and returning it to him during the reviving process, this might fully restore him. As long as we get the incantation right. Well, recite them. Look, I can the wards now get moving! The journeyman has high hopes for this plan because not only did Shiver and the Watcher hate him, but all of the Fallen Lords hated him. For some reason. The Frozen River is crawling with his warlock buddies who will happily blast you and the Dark because Soulblighter is also there to recruit him or kill him. So you maneuver around, trying to lure the Dark into these LARPing flat cannons. Is this all worth it for a clear villain named the Deceiver? What is the plan here? Is he stupid? Close enough. Now let us away. Sunday, February 1st, the Twelve Duns, south of Riornin. The Deceiver is deranged. 
Of this I am absolutely convinced. It's a good start already. He claims to be held in high regard by the Trow. They'll fight alongside the Legion for an entire year if they can be convinced. The question is, will the Deceiver be the one doing the convincing? No, we're going to play Life or Death Capture the Flag. Actually, there are two cool things happening here. For one, a capture point mission is more like something you would play in multiplayer. So it feels different than anything you've played so far, and it adds some depth to the trow. You've only seen small hints of their old civilization, and in the Fallen Lords, you fought them through rivers of blood and rust. At first they seem like giant evil brutes, but there is more to them. Even if you're finding that out through a Capture the Flag game that the Gulls are cheering on. The Trow have joined the team, and while they all head down to the captured fort, they learn that Shiver has already destroyed it. Change of plans, the King wants the Legion to head to Mirthemni, which was where Connaught ruled from. It's not clear why, but you have Trow, and they're good at banishing the evil ones. You get more of that 3D destruction shown off, it's one of the few levels that actually makes you feel powerful. It's not a cakewalk, but it does feel more hopeful. Ulrich reveals the mission is to go beneath the city and find the Ibis Crown. The old empire will be restored with himself as emperor. Legend says the crown has supernatural powers that will spread out into the army. Volunteers in the Legion will go down to find that, while some others go off to try and find the remains of the Tain that shattered when Soulblighter had it. The catacombs are strange and filled with endlessly warring spirits. It's mainly the old empire fighting the Mercridia a thousand years ago, but they'll turn on you too. It's like seeing what's happening now all over again. Should it be this familiar? It's difficult to say, but the crown is retrieved. Ulrich is now emperor, and the journeymen who exiled themselves are now restored as the Heron Guard. Which, like many western fantasy game settings, means that they're now samurai romans. Just in time, too, since the Mercridia came to crash the coronation, including bringing the big Mercridia. Just like that, and the Trow are no longer your ace in the hole. You have to use all of your brain again. The Deceiver and the other part of the Legion are still on the search for the Tain. Ulrich believes that Soulblighter still has a tiny fragment where he's hiding the summoner who's spawning Mercridia. The Deceiver says he can feel a different shard calling to him. Since they're linked through pocket dimension nonsense, he believes he can lead the troops through it and kill the summoner. True to his name and as you've seen before, the Deceiver can turn enemy forces onto his side. It can still be a rough march through burnt out hills, but the Deceiver was adamant that he could get into the Tain. You find it, and true to his word, he leads you through. Even being able to mind control the Mercridia, it's still an oppressive fight. Plus, all the old safeguards are still there. Luckily, the Deceiver finds an item that lets him absorb all the lightning. Past that, heal up your forces, and there he is. The Summoner. You dare threaten me? Here? Okay then. The Summoner is a pain in the ass to fight. Beyond teleporting more bat people in, he'll teleport your guys outside the lightning traps. God's sake, then you come back down and- Oh fuck you and your sparkles. You've gotta wrangle the little freak and- Oh, finally. Man, that explosion was risky. So, no more summoner. You were certainly no Kurgan. Myth games do leave some things open, but the summoner has always felt odd. The Codex prophesies that one day a man will resurrect the Mercridia, and there he is, and now he's dead. Again, this goes back to the Mercridia are strongest off screen. One day someone will show up and bring this monstrously evil race back is something that makes the Total Codex itself a little frightening. It can tell the future, Doom included. Delivering on him, and he's just some guy. He's a conveniently established reason to bring them back. The narrator even says he has no clue how Soulblighter found him. The narrator is usually used effectively for what details don't matter. He can build intrigue or open possibilities, but with the summoner, it feels too undercooked. The dude is just too important to shrug at it like this. We have no clue what his relationship to Soulblighter was. Still, he's resurrecting the Mercridia, and Balor didn't want to do that even if he could, and Soulblighter obviously couldn't. He's also having to do it in the Tain next to the big skull pile, which there could be Mercridia skulls in there, and that implies that's how he's doing it. But he is called the Summoner and not the Resurrector, so maybe he just needs their essence or whatever's attached to the pile in order to bring them back. It might be possible that a more powerful being could simply will them into existence. But enough of that for now, the Deceiver teleports you out, and directly into Soulblighter's camp. The narrator realizes he's done this of his own volition and it might get them all killed. The Emperor won't come save them, he doesn't even know where they are. Everyone, including the Deceiver, are captured. The other prisoners say that Shiver has completely destroyed the Western lands. Now they're all imprisoned and tortured by a shade named Felit. Or the Deceiver mind-controlled him in the chaos. It's a massive prison break, with the prisoners having to help out each other, and then free the Deceiver who has his own special containment chamber. By now you should understand no whack-ass crystal prison can hold this man. But this group can't take Soulblighter in combat. 
And by what clever ruse will you defeat me, Mirdred? Will you hide in my chamber pot? Take this! Oh! oh, that item actually absorbed the lightning. Yeah, later. I have always wanted one of these. From here you can exit to a secret mission, but my actual favorite moment in the game is the next actual one, so let's just go to that. This one's still fun and an actual secret level like the first game, and not the deer hunting. Which is, you know, also funny. The Deceiver has taken one of the crows from Soul Blighter's murder form. Without it, Soul Blighter can't transform into the birds again. They're now off to regroup with the main force, which is fighting Shiver downstream of a river and a dam. If it's destroyed, Ulrich and most of his forces will be completely wiped out. The Deceiver has gone through some shit to get to this point, and now it's time to make his move. If the dam were destroyed, the resulting deluge would kill everything in its path for miles. Upon hearing this, the Deceiver shook his head, his face twisting in anger. He moved slowly through the crowd, commanding all those present to defend the dam, insisting that he would punish those who allowed it to fall. Without another word, he headed downstream. I asked one of the black robes why the deceiver had not stayed to help us, and he tersely replied, he goes to warn the emperor, moving through odd angles faster than any man, and if unobserved, much faster than that. Not only does he not betray you, but it's not out of spite for the fallen, he goes to warn Ulrich. The deceiver was actually ride or die the whole game. Who would expect that from someone so comically evil looking called the deceiver? Well, you know what they say about looks, and the man truly lived up to his name. It's also a nice callback to Kruniak and the Trow. The game keeps up with this theme of there's more to people than you think. We did have that with Balor, but this time around, we're seeing more heroic figures. I just love everything about this scene. The narration, the music, the Deceiver is still drawn as a deranged man. It's like a dark fantasy version of the Grinch, but his heart was big the whole time. His motivation is never elaborated on, and this is one of the moments where that really works. Maybe he was trying to sabotage the Fallen all the way back in the first game. Maybe being rescued and being shown loyalty made him turn around. Whatever the reason, the approaches he takes are colorful, but he's still a force for good. To emphasize that, the dam is saved, but Shiver is still out there, and the Deceiver starts screaming for her blood. For hours on end. So the Emperor gives him a squad of five volunteers to try and kill her. Ah, if it isn't Alric's lapdog, will you bow to anyone who claims the throne of the Cathbruig? The path to retribution does make for strange bedfellows. Would you not agree, Ravana? Okay, there still is a lot of spite in there, but I still like the guy. The years have not been kind, have they? I've said this before, Mildred, and now that mouth of yours is finally going to get you killed. Do you mean to challenge me? You? A lowly camp follower in Damas' vanquished army? Fell it! Teach this cur a lesson! Fell it? Oh, this is where he went. Fool! Why do you hesitate? Well, fell it. Yes, my master. What? <laughs> There. Now she's dead. Casualty. The tales of Ulrich's swordsmanship cannot begin to describe what I have just witnessed. Are we not going to talk about what just happened? Well, the Deceiver is never brought up again, and you can cheese the level so he doesn't die. I would assume he was killed destroying Shiver, but like many Fallen Lords, his death here could be ambiguous. Anyway, check out Ulrich's cool sword. Soul Blighter is caught near the Cloudspine Mountains, actually near the volcano that erupted in the first game. When you get to him, Soul Blighter chastises Ulrich for sacrificing loyal men for his own glory. What would you know of loyalty? The way you say it is only a word. You will never succeed! You will never stop me! The final confrontation is going to be inside the volcano. He looks the way he does because he performed some kind of dark ritual on himself long ago, which gives him outstanding fortitude. The passive heat of the volcano won't kill him. And he's planning to try and detonate the entire mountain range. If he's not stopped here, he'll rule over a world of the dead. It is a tough mission, there are plenty of thralls and Myrcridia and shadow demons. But the nitty gritty of the final confrontation is in a dream duel, so you don't really get to see that. I have killed the whole world! You are mistaken, Soul Blighter. You have only killed yourself. 
You cover Molly Hax's brain, and that's the campaign. That's a high mark for a final cutscene, but there are so many questions piled on. It seems like Soul Blighter wanted simple revenge after all. Until you get to a four minute scrolling epilogue. Myth began with a narrator listening to a journeyman, and it's now going to end the same way. To sum it up, the original journeyman was partially correct, and the world does have ages of dark and light. These are due to laws that govern the very workings of the universe. The passing comet is the sign of that shift. There would be a golden age, and then an age of darkness, bouncing back and forth like Pong, or Nup. The ones who ushered in the Golden Age were always those who stood up against the dark. However, many of these heroes are doomed to return back in the next stage as fallen lords. As the cycle goes on, the champions of light are always different, but the champion of darkness is always the same. A transient being called the Leveler. In ages past, they beheaded and burned the Leveler, cut him apart and spread his body across the world. Pulverized him into dust and spread it beneath a mountain, but he always comes back. Connaught was the last one to wear the mantle of the Leveler and became Balor. He likely knew this, and it's why he hid or destroyed powerful artifacts. Knowing he would return as the Leveler, he didn't want to have an advantage, and also wanted to give the Sight of Light a chance. But if it's every thousand years, why did Soul Blighter show up when it's only been 60? Soul Blighter was not the Leveler. He had potential to be grabbed by it in a thousand years, but that's likely not going to happen. He too was a hero once, so he may have ascended from his Fallen Lord position. Instead, the Journeyman believes that he will suffer at the hands of those who set the cycle in motion. They won't know for sure until 940 years have gone by. The narrator decides to try and join the newly re-established Terran Guard. Maybe he'll live to see it. Though in all likelihood, Ulrich is well positioned to be the next leveler. Okay, this is some Hasbro clue shit right here, so let's break it down. What the comet could be is unclear, but there could be a call forward in Marathon too. There is a rogue star that has been passing through our galaxy for nearly a millennia. We will meet it in one of the great voids between the spiral arms. Probably not, but you never know with Bungie. I don't think it's directly connected to Marathon in a way like, ah, here's where all the missing heads from Hangar 96 went. I don't think it's a metaphor retelling or some planet in the Marathon galaxy. It's not as intertwined as Pathways, but there are similar themes and one big direct connection. Marathon Infinity was a closed story. A beautiful ending about a character in a video game understanding his limits and telling you to go out and do anything. Additions in the setting of Marathon would almost have to be a spin-off. Besides, Myth is already so interesting on its own. It's already been using lots of names and concepts from Celtic folklore, and sometimes it is just window dressing. I laughed at this comment saying the American equivalent was the devil was imprisoned in a legendary stone called the Huckleberry Finn by the great hero Wyoming. But even concepts like the cycle are drawing from some deeper mythos. Hell, bringing up Halloween 3 could be relevant. Glenn Cook's Black Company Chronicles was also a huge influence. Very different worlds, but concepts like the storytelling and the Fallen Lords all have their basis over there. You see bits of it in games like Tyranny as well. Still, that one marathon connection is strong, so let's go back to that Fallen Lord's question. Who exactly was the head? He did trick Alark into the desert looking for a near-invincible suit of armor. And while our cutscene image and angle of Balor isn't great, he could be the head. Maybe that's the armor? The issue with that is that Alric said he was interrogated by Balor, which, unless it means he had powerful dream nonsense, he would separate them out. They never talk to Balor like he's the head when they meet. Well, maybe he is still Balor, and throwing the head into the pit sends him back in time to set everything up, or... Nah, it's complicated. Besides, it's said the Great Devoid would destroy him. He claimed to be one of Connaught's advisors, so the simplest answer is, he's a fallen lord. He was alive through strange magic, wreaked havoc in the light, and was clearly up to his own devices. That's dead on for every other one, they just didn't know what they found. Regardless, why does the Great Devoid destroy Balor? Just from the sounds coming out of it and what it does, we know it's not a simple hole in the ground. This is where the Marathon connection comes in, though arguably, you could say it started in Pathways into Darkness. The Work and Kakinter are eldritch beings, and they can't die, only be put to sleep. They can shape the land and create monsters. Even unconsciously create lesser beings that are so powerful and can create monsters of their own. But that power waters down greatly compared to the creature itself. Sometimes they still lose and drift for millions or billions of years until they slam into a planet somewhere and get buried. Maybe another race uncovered it by mistake, or it shaped the ground above. Either way, it's likely the source to all magic in the setting. So how could I say that, but also that the story of Marathon doesn't matter much here? Put simply, it's just too big. Maybe the comet is something artificial it makes? It could be another one just spinning out somewhere in space? 
The point is, the world of myth is completely under its rules. Maybe throwing the head in the pit worked, or maybe the leveler will come back. It's not their choice. Without a doubt, Soul Blighter was absolutely an evil villain. Throughout most of the game, he honestly doesn't seem too compelling. Then you realize when he's taunting Auric about sacrificing his loyal men for his own glory, he knows that Auric is the next leveler. He was Balor's right-hand man and possibly Connaught's before, so he knew about the cycle. He was trying to force it artificially, and when that didn't work, thought he should just destroy the surface. Soul Blighter may have aspired to be the leveler, or he was trying to free the world in his own deranged way. It's ambiguous, but Myth 2 has more to its characters up to the very end, and that's the strength of the story. I definitely think The Fallen Lords was a tighter tale, and it felt compelling the whole campaign. The sequel feels like it has a good amount of tire spinning in comparison. Soul Blighter himself doesn't seem too interesting until the very end of the game. However, it's still a story that delights in revealing that there's more to its characters. Some are just means to an end, but others that aren't directly elaborated on still have history and intrigue surrounding them. I mean, hell, it's a series where the forces of evil are called The Dark, but the setting and characters are so compelling that it doesn't matter. A major player in the fate of the world can just be a deadly brain. You could do side stories in this world too, and that was proven with Myth 2 Chimera. I think it's worth a brief look here. It takes place a decade after Myth 2, where a journeyman is having visions of a mysterious woman summoning undead. The balance of nature is being upset, an insect group called the Hive is being stirred up. It's a side adventure separate from what you've seen so far, so nothing I'll go over in detail. What I find a lot more interesting is how Chimera came to be. It was a campaign by fan map makers, and Bungie saw how well it was coming along, so stepped in to help make it official. Not just on the technical side or the business side, bundling and selling it with the other games, but employees were providing a lot of voice acting, like Joseph Staten and Martin O'Donnell as main characters. Fenris, is that you, old friend? Forbear, so you are the bear that smells like a man. My friends did not know what to make of you. Jason Jones, Alexander Seropian, and other familiar names and voices. Thank God it's you! The wasps, they're everywhere! It's neat to see Bungie could be involved with the community at that level. Your story and ideas look good, we'll help polish it up and make it canon. You can also tell from the design that this was spearheaded by fans. The levels can be incredible and really show what you can do inside of the engine, but they're also made to thwart myth players, like ambushes that are only triggered by certain kinds of units passing a point. It's a short but difficult campaign that honestly does have a lot of bullshit, yet that's still not a deal breaker because it has some of the most fun and engaging missions in the series plus the new units, abilities, and additions that any expansion should have. The story is essential, but if you like the gameplay, then it's worth a shot. Knowing what it is, I really enjoyed feeling the fun behind it. Unfortunately, this did not leave enough gold in the treasury to purchase scabbards. Mallory proposed a special dues collection to pay for the scabbards, seconded by Martin the Bard, but the motion was defeated. There's also Myth 3. It's a prequel, made by a different company, that went off in their own direction instead of Bungie's. Eh. So that was Soul Blighter, and man, what a fantastic sequel. The gameplay improved or added on to what was great about the Fallen Lords, and they added lots of content for multiplayer, like the map maker and all the new modes. The story kept up pace too, and Bungie had succeeded in making their big war game. The Myth Flame has been kept alive by incredibly talented and passionate fans over the years. Though as of the time of this video, I believe the rights are with Take Two. There's been no word of any kind of official re-release, which is sad for a game that was and is still so loved. Still, at this point the hits with Bungie kept on coming. First the dungeon crawler turned into a trilogy of innovative sci-fi FPS games, and then a series of big violent fantasy RTS games based on physics like nothing else that came before it. But even as Myth 2 was wrapping up, an idea for a marathon successor had been bouncing around. This became Halo, and every Bungie Halo has the Siege of Magical track from Myth. The first one ever is an assault in the control room. You get an achievement called Debut of Magical for finding this, but you can get it earlier in the level, by riding the pelican down a deep, dark pit that slowly fills with fog. I'm not sure why this is or why it's unmarked, but Halo is full of all kinds of mysteries like that. Security to the bridge! The Master Chief has gone rampant! Take him down, boys! Gone rampant? But I thought only... uh-oh. Oh, for Christ's sake, is Nop safe? It's actually just a ball, right? It doesn't mean any- Oh, God!
hand over your pancreas. Give me your pancreas. Give me your pancreas. Hand over your pancreas. Give me your pancreas. So they're just bat people? Yes. Then why was Balor scared of their flag? Mm, I don't know. Maybe he just hates bats. Thanks for making sure I never see them. You are most welcome, boy. I die and get sent to hell. What game do I play for all of eternity as punishment? Uh, oh, League of Legends. What genre did I like more when I was younger, but not so much now? It's not that I disliked them, but I played so many platformers growing up. I know they still make pretty good ones now, and a few weeks ago I picked up Jack 2 just to play it a bit and then kept going for hours. I don't think they're bad, and they are fun when I pick them up, I just don't feel compelled to pick them up as often. Maybe I should give some more a shot. Will there be a Big Bungie lore video? Well, thanks to the magic of live service games, I can't actually play all the Destiny stuff that came out. This would also mean me having to play a lot of Destiny. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Does playing through Myth and Marathon make me appreciate Halo more or less? I mean, now that it's all fresh in my head, definitely more. Like playing Myth, you see the physics and how they script the AI and that's gonna be very instrumental in Halo. It's been fun playing them all like that spread out over a year because there are a lot of connections you notice that way. Beyond the story stuff, you get a better sense of what they enjoyed in their games and it's neat to see. And then what, turnip soup for everyone? No, you don't just eat the biggest turnip in the world. Uh, so, do you make a wish on it? 